It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey there, everybody. It's the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Chick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey, gang. Les Webster. Hello, all. And Liz Newman. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Delightful. Yep. Delirious. <laughs> Dilapidated. <laughs> the lovely. Damn. Hope everybody's doing okay out there. So what's been going on in your corner of the galaxy? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, I knew there was something. It was like, ooh, I got to talk about this, but I don't what even know what it was that now? I watched. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Don't get me started on my Joker rant. Um, oh, did you guys hear about that? No, go away. No, stop it. <laughs> Move along. I just have to say, I stand by James Gunn on that one. I, I don't know if there's like beef between him and Leotto, but they pretty much asked him, you know, why didn't you use him as the Joker in your movie? And it was pretty much because I don't want my movie to suck. <laughs> so I was like, damn. <laughs> You're making it hard not to like you. <laughs> <laughs> he's not wrong. No, he's not wrong. <laughs> well, I said I said it before. I mean, he's that character has been so overexposed, it's not even funny. It's not just the movies, it's or TV shows, or whatever. It's the comics. You know, really, there needs to be like a five-year ban on him. Yeah. No one can use him for about five years. Let him go for a little while. Use somebody yeah. else for a while. Well, and like the standalone movie that they did for him, I, I didn't mind that, though. But it, like you said, every time Batman or Harley Quinn's involved, they're like, ooh, we got to have the Joker. No, we don't. <laughs> we the really jo- don't. The Joker film was interesting, but it didn't have it didn't have to be called Joker, and it would probably right. be it still would be. And we've had we've had this discussion before. It, it would have been fine. Yep. They were banking they were banking on a name, just like any other freaking remake that they do nowadays. Yep. Yeah, you know, they're banking on a nostalgia and the and, and the in the and the and the, the money that's behind that, and you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, because he's so well known, you know, because like you said, he's DC's cash cow. And I have to say, as much as I love Joker and as much as I love Harley, it drives me batty when people are like, oh, I want to love like Joker and Harley. <laughs> what? <laughs> you want a guy who cares nothing about you, who's going to beat the shit out of you and dump you at the first good looking thing that comes along yeah i want to love like joker and harley too. <laughs> I mean, yeah. no thank you <laughs> i think there's meds for that <laughs> yeah. um, but um i've been preparing for i shouldn't say i'm preparing when you told us what the Halloween shows were going to be, it was like, ooh, <laughs> I haven't seen this one or that one in a while. So, I, you know, kind of nostalgia. Well, through all of that, um, somehow Scream got recommended to me. And it was like, you know, I don't, I don't think I watched all of that. I only thought there was three. And then I found out there, there was, was only three. three. There was only three. <laughs> there was only three. I should have stopped at three. Hmm. I found out that there's also plans for five. Yes, and they're bringing back the original cast. So it's kind of, hmm. And you're just like, okay, you know. I, uh, I think, 
especially by four. I had to really search for four, though. I, three they have all together at, um, was it HBO I watched those on? I think it was, and then like four is like off on stars or something like that. So they're not all together yet. But like you said, I, I should have stopped at three. <laughs> the, the, I shouldn't have first, looked so hard for four. <laughs> the first one was pretty good. It was. I, I, I liked it. The second one, it was interesting. It was. It, it kind of kind of surprised me how it went. Mm-hmm. And then, and then when you get to the third one, it's I just like, oh, oh, okay. Like, you why know? did they do this again? Right. Yeah. yeah. And then I definitely said that when I watched four, and I'm not even sure if I watched all of four. Because I was just like, okay. there was no point. The story was basically done with the three films. Yeah, it was. Oh, you could have walked well, away after the, the first fourth one. one still. Was, that's that's a that's a yeah that's that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, you could have just done the first one and said that's it. You know, but you know. Well, the second one wasn't too bad. All right, I I think sometimes it's not bad to have a you know the sequel to it because sometimes with the first one you want to know what happened after, you know. Um, Scream one. Those yeah, sequels. yeah. We, we we discussed this last week. <laughs> These sequels well, are always is... just a rehash of the first one, anyway, because it, the only reason it, it got made was because it was because the first one made a shit ton of money. Yeah. And you're like, oh, do it again. Make another yes. shit ton of money, please. One, yeah, lightning a bottle again. One, one more shit ton of money, please. You know, that's not how that works, but that is exactly how it works. And so yep. they made a subpar movie for the second one. And then the third one, they were like, uh, somebody said, we can do this one more time. I mean, even if we just make a little money off of it, it's okay. And yeah. Then, they, then you get a pile of crap. And then I don't know what the hell the point of the fourth one was. I can't even recall it. And we, we haven't even touched the fact that there was a series. There was a TV series, too. Yeah. Yeah, the fourth one was her cousin. That was the spoiler alert. She was a serial killer trying to like outdo her aunt or whatever. Yeah, that's how forgettable that movie was. Oh, right. It, it Nobody, was, yeah, I that one was don't pretty think I bad. Ever saw it. And then the third one about a movie about the movie was really lame. I couldn't really get into that one too much either. <laughs> I mean, and on the surface, it's not a terrible idea. But, no. man, you still got to execute, and they did not. Yeah. It was it was an interesting idea. I didn't care for the, for the, for the switch or the, the reveal that, you know, I mean, you know, yeah. that was there. Well, see, what I was curious about with the first one was all of her life, or, well, you know, all of that time, she blamed a guy, sent him to prison for killing her mom, and then at the end of the first movie, we find out, oh, it wasn't him. It's your little boyfriend over here. <laughs> so, I, it, I I liked the second one because it kind of explained what happened to him, you know? And of course, the very beginning of the third one, they killed him instantly. So, well, <laughs> yeah. sure. but it was uh, Cotton. That was his name, Cotton. It was kind of neat to see how Cotton dealt with that because you know he went to prison for killing somebody that he didn't kill. So, yeah. well, but, and like like Mike said, it was a it was a carbon copy of the first one. That's so that's exactly what it. Yeah. Uh, it it was. And I'm blanking on his name right now. Who played Cotton? So it, it, Liv Shriver, right? Liv Shriver, yeah. He was basically doing the true Barrymore in the first film. Yeah. Was, was just there in the beginning and then get killed off and now the movie's going. Yeah. You go like, oh, oh, okay, all right. Which I will say, it was kind of funny at the beginning of the fourth one. Or was it the fourth one or the third one where they're going through all of the movies? And so they're showing you like six different girls dying at the beginning of each one. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. They used some big star power in that one too. Oh. 
then after that, it was like, huh. And actually, I think you guys planted the ideal in my head to watch Scream. Because I think we talked about it last week, maybe. Or I think it was Scary Movie that ah, we had talked yes, about. Scary movie. Yeah, That's but we weren't, we weren't trying not, to We were not complimentary of it, though. <laughs> yes. The whole point of what, we were, what I was saying was that those movies were terrible. Right. But once they come up, it's like, ah, oh, we just talked about this. I have to watch it. And I did watch. Uh, you can't blame me for that. You can't blame me for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, it's I will all not y'all's allow fault. you to blame me. No, 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 no. Yep. All your fault. No, 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 no. <laughs> y'all blame us for movies was... all the time. Now it's your turn. It's all your fault. <laughs> Once again, she was not listening, Mike. <laughs> uh, no. no. <laughs> Shocking. I'd say go back and listen to the episode, but I don't know if you know how to do that. <laughs> Shots fired! Shots fired! Beep, 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 beep. Who do I contact? <laughs> <laughs> Quick, let's get the number to nine one one. Nine eleven. I don't find the eleven. Where's the eleven button on this thing? Where's the any key? So, anything else? <laughs> no. I've been watching a lot of true crime stories still. But I won't make y'all fall down that rabbit hole. <laughs> be, 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 be careful because that shit will make you depressed after after a while. Right. I'm just saying, I've been down that rabbit hole too. and that that will That will mess with your mind after a while. Yeah, that's what I was telling Phil the other day. I said, don't mess with me. I've watched enough shows to where I know where to hide your body, where they will not find you. <laughs> I'll even help them look for you. <laughs> <laughs> out, out with the bees. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, with the bees. Yeah, Liz has got her own telltale heart getting ready to happen over here. <laughs> That I would be late. <laughs> no, not not a lot. Just Halloween in July. <laughs> it's kind of fun, huh? It is. And I was thinking it's not too early because there's really not a holiday between now and Halloween. So, no, yay. We're, we usually record the, the all the horror episode around Labor Day. So, yeah, we kind of have yeah. to get moving on this. Yeah. We've only got about six weeks before we need to start being ready. Shit, speaking of which. <laughs> See, for once I get to say I'm ready. <laughs> I am so ready. You get to say you're more ready than I am, but that's not saying much. <laughs> In the words She's of ready. SpongeBob, we... I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> She's ready. We just need to make sure she watched the right things. Oh, well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about you, Mikey? All right. Um, wow, nothing so fun as that. Um, but that's nothing new. I uh, I am not as not quite as ready as Liz is for Halloween yet. Um, I need to start watching some stuff for sure. Um, I also need to get off my duff and start rounding up all the horror people to see who we can get to hang out with us for that. Um, I can do that soon. Yeah. It's not like the group's not already talking about it. They are. Um, but let's see, I actually did, even though I had another road trip this weekend, I managed to still find time. I found a short documentary. Mm. Um, this one was under an hour um, because apparently it was recorded for French TV. I don't know. It was, <laughs> that, that that made it interesting, to, if, if nothing else. Um, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 we'll, we'll put it this way: I much prefer subtitles uh, instead of um, dubbed, really loud, uh, like voiceover translation stuff. Um, that was obnoxious because to be able to barely hear them talking in French in the background and then some some person talking real loud up front translating it that was that was annoying but 
Um, otherwise, it was other than being very short. It was a, it was an interesting documentary. It was on Rita Hayworth. Nice. Um, and there was, uh, it was one of those I flipped past, and I was like, you know, I don't really know anything about her, so I plopped down and watched this thing. Um, she had a, she had an interesting life. Um, I can't say it was a great life, but it was an interesting life. Um, there are actually some pretty terrible things that that happened to her, um, including unfortunately early onset Alzheimer's, which um, in the fifties was not really something or sixties was not really something that anybody knew anything about yet. So it took them like 20 years to figure this out. Um, but yeah, she, not long after like 40, she started like having really bad memory problems, which kind of sucks for an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes acting hard when, yeah. you, when you can't memorize lines and when you sort of wander off in the middle of shooting something and, stuff like that so it was kind of rough in that regard but um like i i I kind of realized as i was starting this that i've really only ever seen one of her movies um i had i had seen the lady from shanghai and that's actually kind of that's like late 40s that's later on um so i was learning a lot um she was mm, really really well known because of the pinup that thing from World War Two, I mean, she was she, she was. I mean, if if you see a a pinup photo from World War Two, there's a real good chance that it's her. Um, and oddly enough, she could also act. Um, she was also a dancer. She danced. Uh, what movie was it? Is it listed here? She danced with Fred Astaire in one of his movies like in the late 30s hmm yeah I mean that held her own I mean was was doing well at it um but yeah I mean she, it was interesting she was also married five times um had had a bunch of kids and I had a hard time finding happiness and so you know fairly typical Hollywood story, unfortunately, but it was interesting because like I said, I didn't really know anything about her. Um, and it, it, I, it is, it is worth finding out about her. I mean, she, 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 she is an interesting enough character in her, in and of herself, um, especially in those early years, those early Hollywood years. But yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. It was good. Nice. Cool. I'm glad you found that. Yep. Okay, Les? For me, I attended a wrestling match over here in Garland. Mm. Um, The group uh, AEW held a series of matches they must have had I want to say 10 to 15 matches started at 6 o'clock I went up to get us sodas and by the time I got back they had already gone through 5 of the matches dang wow. they're not messing around so what they were doing were they were going live at um, at seven. This was through uh, Turner, and at seven o'clock, just like they announced, they started the the process. And Tom and I were there for those matches and there were I think probably five or six of those and then they came out and said okay now we're going to film for another location and we're all sitting there going okay let's keep going so 
uh, we gave out at about 1030, something like that. And they still had like two matches after we left. So it was a freaking full day. It's interesting to how, how they present it and how you become wrapped up with the heroes and heels. So if you get a chance, try one out there. There are some locations that are uh, producing right now which is kind of good. That means that they're getting back out there in front of the public. So I, I enjoyed it. It's a good three, four hours, and no one got hurt. No one body slammed me, so I was okay. And that's the way I like it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All righty. Yeah, that's neat. <clears throat> yeah. Glad you had a good time. Uh, for me, not a whole heck of a lot. I would like to say that I watched the documentary, but I didn't complete it. I, I actually stopped watching it. it. It was an hour and 48 minutes long. And I think I got to 35 minutes into it, and I said, "I'm I'm done with this." Um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to list I'm not going to list the name of it, but it, it's 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 produced, directed, and starring someone who's done a bunch of these type of documentaries, and he was actually on uh, on a show on a reality show few years back i did not know that until i actually did some research on this guy but he is a paranormal investigator and basically what this was was he was doing a tour promoting his last film and doing these classes and and, and you know that kind of stuff well he was invited to go to australia so he was there he did he did several shows there and while he was there he was approached by a paranormal team there and they kind of met and all that kind of stuff well he comes back he comes back home well they reach out to him with the opportunity to investigate this this island that was originally Aborigines were there originally, and then it became a prison island. I mean, it's Australia, of course. Uh, and then it became a shipyard, and then a military, a naval shipyard. And now it's just basically open for the public for camping or that kind of thing. So he goes back out there to investigate because apparently there's some really strange stuff that has happened. Um, I was kind of interested in kind of hearing about this, but the problem in, the problem I had with it was it was so much style and no substance. You know, he he pulled out his Photoshop or something like that so he can have different graphics. You know, you you, you can't just have a graphic of, of okay, here's the location, and here's the or the time and all that. No, it's got to be flown in like a dart in an angle, something like that. It was it was it, he tricked it up. He tricked it up, and then even some sequences where they had some of the people who come to the show up to the shows and want to kind of give their opinion and all that kind of stuff. You can't just sit here and watch and, and, and listen to what they have to say. He's got to throw up their their quotes in big-ass, funky le- letters. I mean, he's just he's tr- he's tricking the whole goddamn thing up. 
And obviously this guy has one hell of an ego because, I mean, most of that 35 minutes is showing him. And he's talking, and it's not like he's talking about the stories of the place or anything like this. It, it's just he's just talking, and it, it, you, you, they can't focus on just him. They got to cut off to a slow down footage of him looking off somewhere else, and it's in a different. You know, it's, it's like in maybe colored blue or we got to clo- have close up of his eyes it's it's just you know it's just so much let's focus on this dude and i'm and it just it really it really got on my nerves it's just like you know what if the story is interesting you don't have to do this shit <laughs> right <laughs> isn't that the, isn't that the as isn't that the deal with the documentaries if it's an interesting story the story's going to sell it let's just it, it, you know, you can say you give them props for trying to do something different, but the problem was it didn't help. Right. It didn't help. It didn't help pro, pro, uh, move the story or, or get you interested. Matter of fact, it turned – like I said, it turned me off. I mean that's, that's – that was sad because I was kind of interested. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh Oh, I would not recommend it. And then I go on IMDb and start looking at the reviews, and they're pretty much saying the same goddamn thing. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm not the only one that has this problem. Okay. Mm. I feel better about myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're not all winners. Well, and, and I can understand, but it just, like I, I mean, I'm not going to rehash what I just said. It just, the presentation was just. Was just unnecessary. It, it, yes, yes. I mean, yeah, you're right. All documentary, you know, not all documentaries are gonna be are gonna be great. But you know, the one I talked about a couple weeks ago that was I it had to be made for TV. The the many faces of Dracula. That was a hell of a lot more interesting, and it. I mean, I learned a few. A few few things and you know it just yeah i don't know so, mm-hmm. you didn't like it that's okay i didn't like it no mm. that's okay i made up for it by watching towering inferno there you someone, go someone was showing that and i was like i hadn't watched this in a while there you go i've never seen that movie i well, remember when you, you brought up Towering Inferno. I saw that first run. I also saw Earthquake first run. Mm-hmm. And in that one, they had wired the seats to vibrate. Oh, nice. Cute. And the first first time it started vibrating, you wouldn't believe how many people jumped up and looked back at their chair. <laughs> nice. Thinking, what the hell? That's cool. <laughs> But, but you know you know me when I'm watching something I've I've got to do a little research so I looked into this and you know it's one of those I don't want to stop, I was going to say something but I won't go ahead and say it but it was just it's, it it's been a lot of time talking about how the agents for Paul Newman and Steve McQueen had to argue about who was going to get top billing. Mm-hmm. And actually, William Holden was supposed to get top. He wanted top billing, too, but they said, uh, yeah, you're not. You just forget about it. Sorry, dude. <laughs> right. So what what they what they did and I went and look and look I was like, OK, yeah, how they would do it that kind of appease them is like on the poster, you may have Steve McQueen's name on the right a little bit higher than Paul Newman's, and then elsewhere it would be exact opposite. So they just, so they were just play they just played this game. Okay, well he's shown first here, but he's shown you know second there, that kind of thing. I'm like, man, I mean it, bravo for them to try to come up with a situation, but it's just like, come on guys. 
is, does it really does it really matter? Well, it, it matter to them obviously. Mm. Who was put up first? It is, uh, I mean, they even did it in the credits. That's that's how that's how petty. <laughs> petty, thank you. Hey God, did they have to do that? Yep. So, yeah, I mean, I I like the film. I know I know there are some, you know, there's there's stuff in there. You go, oh God, oh man, it's so bad. In in terms of dialogue and stuff, but it just. But you know, it's 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 just a nice little popcorn movie. That's what most of the you know, that's what all the disaster films are. You know, you know, you don't go into them expecting Shakespeare, <laughs> right? Clearly, you've never seen a, a, a production of Titus Andronicus, but anyway. Well, okay. Well, I stand, <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> Sorry. English degree. I had to nerd out for a little bit there. <laughs> so. It's actually a really nice one. With I think Anthony Hopkins was in it. This was probably ten years ago or something. But anyway, a movie yeah. version. I have to check it out. Not a happy story. <laughs> oh, good. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we get into this week's uh, discussion, we wanted to make you aware uh, that we do have a Discord, that you're uh, more than welcome to come join us. Uh, it's where we post uh, news items. Uh, we'll post some fun stuff. We have some activities on there, uh, other types of discussion. We've had movie nights on there uh it's free the sign up is free the discord app is free if you want to join us you just go to our homepage www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net and just click on the image saying join our discord that's all it is and you're in so. all right um, what are we doing this week? We are doing a casting call. Yay. Yeah, it's a little, a little bit overdue, okay. but uh, we're, we're, we're good. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, what we do is just we'll, we will take, we've done comic books but we've done other 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 things where we basically decided to do a casting call, maybe at a different time period and a different format. We've done we've done streaming uh, TV series uh, more currently. We've done TV shows in the '60s, uh, like uh, doing a '60s version of Avengers. Or, or something like that, and we just decided to. I, I distribute a list to to the guys, and they uh, cast. Uh, they picked their cast uh, for the their choices for the cast members. Boy, I'm having problems right now. I apologize. Um, for this one, we are doing a little something different. A just crazy idea came to me. And it was actually a little bit harder than I expected it would be. Uh, I don't know about for you guys, but um, to celebrate a little bit further the 40th anniversary of Raiders of Lost Art, I decided let's do Raiders of the Lost Ark as a 1939 movie serial because that's basically the 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 inspiration for the for the film and the franchise were the movie movie serials. So with that, who would like to go first with her casting choice? No one. Oh good. Well good night. <laughs> good night. See you next week. Um I'll go. I'll do it. I'll start All it right. off. 
And I'm going to start it off with a, a little, a, a, a little bit of a, I don't know. Call me, call me nitpicky if you want. Call me a rebel. I don't care. Um, call you a space cowboy. You, you can call me a space cowboy. Woo! <laughs> you, you could call, you could call me the gangster of love too if you want. But anyway, <laughs> but but don't ever call me Maurice. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am going to be and this is this is something that occurred to me really late in the process or I probably would have brought it up before. Um I I'm going to fiddle with the with the with the date on this. Um I think what happens if you make if you try to make this story in 1939 is I think the United States government shows up and says no. Um because okay. you've got that that fun little Perfect. issue of who's the bad guy in this movie? Mm-hmm. It's the Nazis. In 1939, we were still neutral, oh, and we true. were not trying to piss off no Nazis. So I think this gets shelved until about 43 or 44. Okay. At that point, nobody gives a shit. At that point, the Nazis are the enemy, and it's fine. Um, so that that is my only nitpick. Um, I actually didn't bother worrying about it as i was pulling cast members for this because uh it's really only a few years difference um but okay so that's my nitpick um that said let's get started let's start off with the big boy um indiana jones um we're we're, we're we got to have an indiana jones we got to have somebody who can do the the action scenes the getting into fist fights and and pulling out a gun and shooting people and he carries a bull whip and he wears a cool hat and yet somehow he still has to be able to hold his own in a classroom because he's effectively a college professor um and given our time frame here see this is i think i i also think we're going to bump into each other a lot more than we normally do on this one because I mean, this is 80 years ago. The people who are famous, they weren't there weren't as many of them back then. So, yep. um, but I went with somebody who had recent who who had recently shaken up well, pretty much the Eastern Seaboard um, in one fell swoop, um, and then went on a couple of years later to make one of the more important films in history. Um, I'm going to pick a young Orson Welles to oh. play Indy. Okay. It's an interesting choice. Um, he's, like I said, he's a bit young, but with Indy, I don't know that that matters. Yeah. And I also think in Citizen Kane, he proved that he could act old if he needed to. So age is somewhat irrelevant in, 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 in that role or for him. So I think that I think I think I I I think he can do it. I think I mean he's yeah. young, but I think he can do it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting choice. Yeah. Okay. I was kind of lost on this because I don't know a lot of these actors. So forgive me if I make a lot of mistakes on this one. Um, I stayed with more of a professor type look. I, I figure he could probably do just about anything, you know. And I went with James Stewart. He would have been about 31, which would have put him at that professor age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's <laughs> kind of in the middle of not young, but not old yet either, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and honestly went on later and did a bunch of, I mean, not necessarily a ton of action movies, but Westerns. I mean, there's some, yes. there's some physical demands there. So I think yeah. he can do it. Yeah, absolutely. I can see him doing it. And he's a likable enough guy. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I had considered him, but I did not go with that choice, but yeah, I did. So don't feel, don't, so yeah, yeah you're fine. So it makes you feel better. Yeah. You're fine so yeah. far. Yeah. That's a good choice. He was, he was definitely on my radar. Yeah. You want me to go next, Les? Yeah, please. Okay. He, 
my choice, of course, I I had done all this with it being the 39. I had not taken into account what you said, Mike. So I had geared mine towards that time, that around that year. My choice was a little bit on the young side. He's known for doing kind of the states, kind of the statesman, the instructor, the professor, that kind of thing. But he's done a, a little bit of action, and I'm thinking about one particular one film in particular. Um, and that film is The Guns of Navarone. I went with Gregory Peck. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought of him this early. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, he was r- real young in 39, but if we put it to 43, then, you know, you, 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 know, you put some years on him, then probably be a little bit of a better fit. Cool. Yeah. For me, I chose... Actually, I've got two for it. Okay. And both of them played (laughs) Superman. (laughs) One is Kirk Allen, who was uh, Superman for a while. The other is George Reeves. I'm going to go with Reeves in this one. That would have made him about 25 at the time of shooting. So, I, Reeves can do comedy. Reeves can do action. So, for me, this was a pretty easy choice. It was just the problem of trying to choose between Kirk Allen and George Reeves. And George Reeves, in 1939, was a member of the cast for Gone with the Wind. Wind, yeah. Oh, was he? Interesting. Yes. Yep. So, it didn't take me too much effort to find that one. Nice. That's that's not one I would have thought I would have thought of, but I I do like that choice. Yeah, I could see it. Yeah, that's cool. I wouldn't. Have yeah, thought he definitely. Either. Yeah, he definitely handled the action. Uh, he could he could do the he could do the the classroom environment as well. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Next. All right. Next on our list is Marcus Brody, who is Indy's colleague, um, friend, confidant sort sort of guy. Yeah. Um, he's the guy who kind of works with him at the college or appears to. And yeah, um, maybe a slightly older guy. Um, probably not quite so athletic. Um, but you know that sort of guy yeah. um kind of if if not a sidekick part of what i have thought i've have kind of gotten my head with this is since we're talking about a serial thing um we're talking about multiple episodes so i kind of pictured for 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 you young folks for you young whippersnappers um i've kind of pictured a kind of a short run netflix series type thing with i don't know like six to eight episodes of anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour each. So my thinking here is that we're actually stretching this story out somewhat. Um, so you get the opportunity to flesh out some of these, a character like Marcus. Um, and to, honestly, you get to get a little more screen time with some of the other folks later on as well. Um, so, this is this is what I'm I'm worried about in terms of my pick, um, because it, uh, this is a guy who's got quite a bit of presence, more presence than I probably would normally have gone with, but I kind of couldn't resist sticking him in here just because of the time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going with Humphrey Bogart. Um, I think you you stick Bogart in a role like this, um, and if you have trouble picturing him. Um, and this is going to get slightly obscure. Um, if you've seen Sabrina, 
the original one, not the one with Harrison Ford later on, which they were talking about irony. But anyway, um, his character in that is a lot like what I would see him doing with the Marcus role. Um, it's definitely not an action movie, um, but to to stick kind of a, I don't know, almost like a bank executive type person mm-hmm. in a situation where he's got this friend who's this like action hero and might get dragged along on a on a on an adventure accidentally and would just kind of bumble his way through it. I, I think to see Bogart do that would be utterly awesome and hilarious. I like that. I do too. To place him in something that you're not accustomed to seeing him. Definitely. Yeah, to put him to to like make him like this really high powered second banana in some side adventure that you do along the way through the serial thing. You do you're doing this like episode two before we really even get started. Yeah, I just think it would be awesome. I think it would be hilarious. Okay. I like that idea a lot. Me too. Well, mine's not as fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't figure any of them would do this. That one was kind of a long shot for me, but yeah. Um, I don't know. When, when I picked this one... He just he kept coming back to me, so I picked Spencer Tracy for this one. <laughs> and actually, in 1939, he was kind of doing a safari adventure kind of movie. So, you know, <laughs> he might have been too far off. His name may come up later. Uh-huh. Just, just uh-huh. saying. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can totally course. see it. Yeah. He would yeah. do that. He would. He could do the same thing I was talking about with with Bogart because he could. He can go. He he's just got that range, you know. Yeah. Tracy has just got that range. Would be cool. I like that one. Yeah. For me, I picked someone who was time time wise. He was only a couple of years older than Denim Elliott played Brody in the first film. Um, I, I didn't really think about, I I was thinking more of the kind of the, the mentor, obviously friend. I didn't think about the whole thing of, of him being dragged along, but that's always a, that's always a possibility. Uh, Although maybe a little bit difficult for this actor, but I think he could, he, he could do it because he, did it at all. My old Barrymore. Ooh. That's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that totally gives you a different Marcus Brody, but that's not a bad yeah. thing at all. Yeah. Not a bad thing at all. That's cool. I like it. For my Marcus, I brought in Judge James E. Hardy. Lewis Stone. Oh, I like that. Uh, Thomas said that he wanted the mentor-like, and that's what I was looking at also. And obviously, uh, Stone had done comedy enough that he knew what timing was and, and the like, so that's where I went. Yeah, I like that a lot. Cool. And I could I could see him being dra- dragged along on adventures as well. So yeah, yeah, I definitely that's a, that's a good one. Yep. All righty. Next. Okie dokie. Um, next in line, we've got Sala, <coughs> who, as you'll recall from the movie, was Indy's. Um, contact, friend, um, guide, if you will, in Cairo, in Egypt. Um, and this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to top John Reese davies 
Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, he was just, oh man, he was just great in that role. Um, and I'm, I'm actually a little fuzzy on why I picked this, this, this actor, but I still think, I, I think it's because I think he would do interesting. He could do interesting things with this character, especially if we get more of this character in the serial than we did in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. I picked Sydney Green Street. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see it as well. That's a good one. Yeah, he just was. He's just a guy who did a lot of interesting stuff in in that time frame in the movies. I mean, what he did in he was in the Maltese Falcon, right? Yep. What yes. he did in that, I just. I just I don't. I, I knew that. I just. You were uh, just testing he, this. Uh, yeah, sure. What, yeah, we'll go with that. That's, that's one what of those... he did in uh, uh, Casablanca. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spectacular. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that would have fit, that would fit in well with the, with, the, with the Sala type character. Um, I think it would be fun. Yeah. Well. Well, I picked someone who also had Casablanca ties, and I wanted to tap on that exotic ethnic kind of feel, I guess, that I, I can't pronounce his name. Sal, Sala Sal. gave to us. So I went with Peter Lore. Mm, another name that might come up later. <laughs> <laughs> I almost picked him for one of the Germans, but I didn't. I thought with the, the things I've seen him in, he's had like the crazy hair and stuff. So I kind of thought he, they could, could tap him into that Middle Eastern part pretty well. Sure, sure. It would, that it, sounded it, racist. It, it would be. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want well, to touch that I mean, far into it. But. Well, and, and I was trying to be real careful not to do that, too. But um, <laughs> it kind of, I mean. You, the deal is, I mean, Sala is intended to be a native of Egypt. I mean, he's so he's every at, up to that point, all these other characters are basically white males, and yeah. because that's kind of the American standard, unfortunately, or especially back then. Um, so yeah, I mean, you get the mysterious foreigner type, and that's that's a stereotype. And honestly, that's a stereotype. And I was just kind of saving this for later, but that's a stereotype that that Peter Laurie fit into his whole career. Yeah. Because yeah, he did come from Germany. Um, he he his his breakout role was in a German film, um, and he got kind of stuck in that. I mean, he basically got typecast from that. And. That's so. This would actually be a cool role for him because he would actually get to be a good guy for a change. Yeah. Because he yeah. got typecast in villain roles all his career. Yeah. So that would be really cool. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and you will you'll hear some ties to Casablanca later on this list. Let me just I'm just saying that right now. <laughs> uh, for me. I tried to find someone who would actually look like he was from Cairo. Um, and that was kind of, that's kind of difficult. I mean, y'all kind of, y'all, y'all just touched on that, but you know, I, I, I think of when I think of Salah, I think about the dependable sidekick who has a, an infectious laugh, but is is there when you need to be there? And so I picked Alan Hill Sr. Hmm. Neat. Okay. Because I'm I'm thinking of all of the Errol Flynn's films he was in, especially Robin Hood. Mm, Little John. Little John. Absolutely. So. Hmm. Yep. Cool. 
Do you folks remember the movie Topper? Topper. Sounds, I've heard of it. I don't think I don't know that I've seen it. I have Topper seen is it. is the guy who is haunted by a couple of ghosts, and they are uh, um, well to do. They died in a car crash. They ended up being with Topper and giving him hell. Well, this guy was not Topper. <laughs> uh, neither was he anything big well he was in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington he played a guy who was trying to wrangle the votes to make sure that things happen the way the villains wanted and he also played in Adventures of Robin Hood of, as Friar Tuck uh, this, this is Eugene Paulette. Eugene Paulette, I think, is a fun person to watch because of his deep voice. And he gets down there and gr- uh, growls mm-hmm. when time is, is uh, not on his side. So that was my choice, Eugene Paulette. He was in... Uh... Zorro, Marco, the Mark yeah. of Zorro. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yeah, which we he was also in my, my Man, Godfrey. Nice. I like hmm. it. I like it. Me too. I, I, yeah. I'm now disappointed that I didn't think of him the first time around. That's yeah. good. All right. Next. Okie dokie. Next up, we've got Marion. We can't we can't do a Raiders of the Lost Ark without Marion Ravenwood. Um, Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, never, not, never mind. Not, not quite either, because and I uh, that would have been interesting. But um, I when I was c- kind of looking around, I had a little, I actually struggled a bit with her because I'm like who. In that who play, who in that time frame could could play someone tough enough to be to be Marion, but also kind of still be Marion. It's, it's a very tough role to, to cast. Um, you can you can it's easy to capture one side of her or the other, but to to get a balance is tricky. Um, and I. Decided eventually on Barbara Stanwyck. Good choice. That's a good one. Because yep. the toughness I thought was important. Um, and so I kind of went into it looking for someone leaning in that direction. And I think she just fits the bill really well. She does. Yeah, yes. she does. My pick, I wanted to stay with kind of more of the girl next door than the bombshells that 39 has to offer us. Mm, That was one of the things I found hard. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, But also, like you said, she, she has to be a strong character to, you know, to combat all her surroundings there. So I went with Vivian Lay. Scarlet's daughter in Gone with the Wind. But she's she's pretty. Don't get me wrong. Sure. She's not that. You know, she's more of the girl next door than the Bette Davis. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, kind of. That's a, that's a, that's a good choice. I like that one. Yep. Um, for me. It's funny how certain films seem to kind of stick with us. I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing some themes here. Mm. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I went with with an actress who didn't show off the tough side like uh, Stanwyck did and did so well, but a very strong actress. But could also play the the other side if she had to. 
I went with Mary Astor. Yeah, oh. I thought about her too. She was she was in my short list for sure. Yeah, okay. she would have done it well too. Yep. Yep. I mean, again, yeah, you're talking Maltese Falcon again. Yeah. And yeah, she was. That that role was was interesting because I mean she was I mean clearly she was there was a toughness to that character. Yeah. That that she was doing her damnedest to hide. In that in that role, and so that I, I think that's an interesting twist there. But yeah, I can totally see her in that role too. Yeah, I like that. My choice comes from mysteries also, but it, there's a lot of movies that she did for as a, a light uh, actress. Myrna Loy. <laughs> to me, Myrna Loy could stand up to most anybody. Oh, God, yes. Mm. And I, of course, I enjoyed her in, what, five Thin Man movies? Mm-hmm. I believe so, yeah. And she was, to me, she was fresh in every one. She gave you a little more as the progression went. But to me, Myrna Loy could stand up to Indy. She could stand up to uh, Renee. She could stand up to anybody. So that's that's where I went. That's that's a good one. Yeah, that is. she's another one I was thinking about. Yeah, like I said, the, the list of, the, of this is not very long, but yeah. Yep, she's a good one. Yep, I like it. Okay. Uh, All righty, it's time to take a darker turn. Um, mm-hmm. It's time to head over to the other side of the of the cast here. <laughs> Um, and so let's get this started off with Rene Belloc. Um, he, as you will recall, um, was Indy's opposite number for the quote unquote organization of less than reputable archaeologists. Um, not that there was an organization or anything. Um, he was just the guy who tended to get in Indy's way and he did so with always bad intentions um and this was kind of weirdly this was an easy choice for me um because if you've if you've watched enough orson welles movies um you will not be surprised that i picked joseph cotton for this um because they just they just work together really well um, and in some of the time, some of the times they've worked together, they've been buddies and sometimes they've been enemies and cotton can keep up with him. And honestly, he's a pretty damn good actor in his own right. Um, I've seen him in other stuff too. And he, he's, he's, he's good. Um, yeah. and I, and I thought he would be an interesting personification here of Belloc. Hmm. Very nice. It is. Well, I went more fridge. No problem. <laughs> I went with Jean Pierre Amont. Oh wow. Cool. I figured he could do because I mean Renee's not bad looking either. <laughs> I think that's why they kind of rival the two. You've got one on the good side and one on the bad side. So I think he could he could do it and he made his start in French films. So. Yeah. 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 Well, for me, this was probably one of the first ones I, I cast when I started doing this there with Belloc, of course there's the, 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 the knowledge and the intelligence, but there was also the suaveness, mm-hmm. a very good looking guy. And look, and, and there's, there's the start, the dark side that's kind of underneath 
that, you know, you really shouldn't be trusting this guy, but <clears throat> he also acts like he could be your best friend. I went with Claude Rains. Somehow I knew that was coming. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. He would be awesome in this role. Yeah. I mean, just look at him in The Invisible Man, for example. Yeah. Look at him. Get it. Come on, people. Jeez. Yeah. Let's get oh, I got it. <laughs> oh, okay. It wasn't good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he was in Casablanca, too, wasn't he? He was. Yep. He was the cop. Yep. I'm astonished to find out that there's gambling in this establishment. Here's what it is. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, I like it. Yep, me too. My choice was suave in a lot of his movies. He, to me, his best film was the role he played in the movie Mr. Roberts, which was his last movie. Um, he just he had walked away from Hollywood because Roberts was done in '55, and his co-star I already picked. It's William Powell. Yeah. Mm. Once you said Mr. Roberts in his last film, I'm like, oh, Powell, that would. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, me too. Oh, and the flirting, the flirting between. Doc and Marion would take on <laughs> such a different it would be such a different thing to watch. That would yes. be amazing to see. Yeah. Between yeah. William Powell and Myrna Loy, that would be yeah. unbelievable. To it could be so much fun to see that. To, just to see the different take on that. Oh, wow. That would be cool. Yeah. Because they did Thin Man in 34. So, you know, five years later they do this mm-hmm. oh and not only did they do it they had been doing it they did it a few yeah. times they they had done it three or four or five times already by then to yeah, see them was, take, oh man that would be cool yeah there was yeah they did several other films besides the thin man uh, so yeah yeah they had three of the five thin man movies by then but i'm sure they had some crossings other than that so yeah, that would be cool. yeah. I'm I'm trying I'm trying to remember some of them off the top of my head, but yeah, it wasn't just the Thin Man. So yeah, there, there were several of them because, and I'm sure it was because of the Thin Man. They got oh, the chemistry's great. We got to get them back together. Mm-hmm. So they say there was 14 collaborations they did. Wow, well, there you go. Nice. Let's make it 15 and completely turn that chemistry sour. That would, be, that would just that would just be cool. Yeah. All right. I'm all right. I'm, I'm done now. It's fine. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Give you guys the collaborations. All right. Next. Okie dokie. Um, so next we get a fun roll. Um, we get. Our everybody's favorite Gestapo guy, Major Arnold Tote. Um, and who just doesn't who doesn't just love the Gestapo? I mean, come on. Um, and we talked about bumping into each other earlier. I talked about bumping into each other earlier. Here's where we start getting some crossover casting, because I couldn't think of anybody but Peter Lorre for this role. Oh. I couldn't think of anybody but him, but him. Um, and he's he's just he he got hardcore typecast as kind of the creepy foreign guy, and I mean did it his whole career pretty much. I mean I guess I guess Corman gave him some not creepy foreign guy roles later on, but that was a, that was a different part of his career. Um, in his younger days, I'll tell you, if you if you haven't seen M, 
from 1931. It's a German film, and it's the movie that that made Peter Lorre. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen it, track it down. It is a really interesting movie about a really terrible character. And Peter Lorre is just genius in it. It is entirely worth watching. Um, yes. It is, it is creepy, but it is really good. Um, and, I mean, if you, if, you, if you see that and you then all of a sudden can't believe that Peter Lorre could play Gestapo, then phew, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> he, 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 yeah, I mean, he would just be... I don't want to say perfect in this role, but man, it would be good. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, okay. You're, you're next Liz, right? Yeah. This one was the one that I almost put the, the German in. <laughs> right. I mean, naturally. So he, this guy's German. Right. After thinking about this, what I'm not happy with my choice, I picked um, Charles, Charles Boyer. And, yeah, after thinking about it, I wouldn't cast him in that because he was more of the suave, which this guy wasn't. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have one for this one. <laughs> you say that. I mean... I think again we're talking about stretching this out several hours um, I don't know that this is such a bad idea I mean the, the guy I mean the, the guy they picked for for Raiders in 81 sure I mean he's kind of a yucky looking guy yeah but you've got he's gonna this guy's gonna be in this a lot more than the seven minutes or whatever that I don't even remember the guy's name, unfortunately, was in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So you can make him a yucky guy without him looking yucky. Yeah. You can use, you know, I don't know, acting or something to do that where you have since you have time to do it. So, yeah, I could I can see making this guy yucky. No problem. Yeah, you do it with you do this with a range of different actors. Um, I think most of the stuff I'm looking at, he's he's the good guy. So, so I was like, mm, I don't know, because you'd need someone who, not necessarily like yucky, but someone who had a nasty attitude, you know, a get one over on you kind of type person, you know. I don't know. I should have thought about that one a little longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hang, hang, hang on. I got another pick coming. That's that's that that's not that far off of what you what of where you could go with this. So, uh, yeah, I don't I don't necessarily think it's that terrible an idea. I think I think it's all right. Cool. I think it's workable. Did Did you say Charles Boyer? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I said Boyer though. So well, that's yeah. okay. I, I just want to double check. <laughs> he's French. He's French. The letters don't work the same in French. The letters are weird. It's fine. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> um. Yeah, I I didn't. I I kind of went low dangling fruit here. Uh, but I. And I didn't go exactly the way the character was in the film. Obviously, the kind of the smaller, not suave or, or all that, all that handsome. But uh, I, I went back to that Casablanca tree, and I went with Conrad Veet because he played a lot of Germans. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I like that too. He he he, he did all right too. Mm -hmm. My choice. I'm trying to remember if he was in Casablanca. <laughs> but we'll I know he, he was in Destry Rides again. And I took uh, Misha Hour. 
M-I-S-C-H-A-A-U-E-R. Say that he does a lot of crazy type uh, films, and I thought that this one could be fit with somebody that's got a little humor in it, and yet can be such an idiot like he was in Death Street Right Skin, which was a uh, G- uh, Jimmy Stewart movie. Uh, he was also in My Man Godfrey with William Powell, so that would have been work. That would have been yeah. nice since they would be working together. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at a picture of pictures of him, and yeah. I, I could see him in that part. Absolutely. He's sure in a lot of movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, that's me. Um, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like, why didn't Tom jumping in there? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm spoiled, that's why. Um, but anyway, so, um, I guess our last pick here is, um, Colonel Herman Dietrich. Um, he was kind of the, the chief Nazi really, um, in the whole gang of Nazis who were trying to get the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and it's fun if you haven't, if you're not familiar um, if you haven't looked into um, Nazi occult studies, um, there's some interesting rabbit holes there um, because they actually did a lot more of this sort of thing than most people realize. Um, but anyway, um, that is that is all stuff that has been published. So it's it's interesting to say the least. It's, it's fun to see that there really were Nazis running all over the world trying to find occult artifacts to bring back to Berlin. But I digress a little bit. Um, so this guy in Raiders was, I mean, he was not an old guy. He was not a young guy. Um, he wasn't super, he was kind of a little bit nondescript anyway. Um he was good at standing around screaming orders at things. Um, and this is this is where I went a little left turny, to say the least. Um, I actually picked Spencer Tracy for this. <laughs> just because he's got presence. True. And, and especially if you're going to, like I said, stretch this, this out into a longer story. Mm-hmm. This is a character you could have some fun with. And if you're going to have fun with it, let's put Spencer Tracy in it. Because, man, it, it, you, could, you could go in any direction. Because Tracy did drama, he did comedy, um, he did some war films. So, I mean, action is not totally unknown to him. Right. right. Um, also, the idea of watching him try to punch Orson Welles would honestly just be hilarious. It would be awesome. So... There you go. Nice. Spencer Tracy comes back around. Yeah. There you, go. <laughs> you warned us. I did. Okay. Um, my pick for this one. <laughs> you sound so confident. I, I forgot he played Robin Hood. <laughs> so. <laughs> I I went with Earl Flynn. Not going to lie, I actually considered him for this, too. Yeah. Seriously. Because, like you guys were saying, you needed someone demanding and, you know. Mm-hmm. And in your face. Yeah. And if Robin Hood can't pull that off, I don't know who can. Right. Right. So, yeah, I totally can see it. I like it. <laughs> well, speaking of Robin Hood. <laughs> I picked an actor who's probably best known for playing heroes, but he's played villains, including in Robin Hood. 
Basil Rathbone. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. Good choice. Mm-hmm. I like it. What you got, Les? Okay, for my end. Huh. Who do I pick? I'm going to go with this. <laughs> He played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1931. Uh, he was in A Star is Born in 37. And uh, to me, his best role was uh, Matthew Harrison Brady in Inherit the Wind. My choice is Frederick March. Hmm. Cool. And now that I bring up Inherit the Wind, I want to go watch it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that to me is one of the best movies. I don't think I've ever seen that. I guess I need to rectify that. <clears throat> Gene Kelly, Frederick March, Spencer Tracy, uh, See, Dick, I, first Darren. York. Dick York. Dick York, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is, scares me that more than one of us got that reference. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you start talking about um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Inherit the Wind, and the first thing I'm thinking is, dude, I just picked Spencer Tracy for this. What are you yeah, talking about? Like 31. You said 31. You said 31. You said 31, and I'm like, no, that wasn't Tracy yet. He did that later. So, yeah. Cool. But yeah, Frederick Marsh would be cool. I like it. Wow. Another great casting call. Uh, I I I think so. I love all the choices. Our our oldest one yet. Yeah. It would be, I don't know, it would be weird to go further back in time than this. Well, I don't think we will. (laughs) We'd all end up picking the same person for every role. It would be weird, but yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we're gonna pick. We're gonna pick the guy that was the Douglas the Fairbanks. Moon. Yeah, <laughs> or Douglas Fairbanks. Yeah, Douglas Fairbanks or the guy who was the moon on the first flight to the moon. How did he do all those amazing stunts with such little feet? Little feet. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's dragging one back. See, Liz is learning to just laugh along with the rest of us when we make those weird ass jokes. <laughs> I've learned not to ask. Uh-huh. Ask later. We won't. We won't mind. Yeah. It's okay. It's usually, when I go to Google Food, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not. This this happened about a week or so back. Uh, I was on Twitter, and there was some tweet. It was it was it was mentioning Hedy Lamar, and right underneath it is is a response from a account that's it's 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 called that it's Headley, and that's what it says. Yeah, it's Headley. <laughs> I'm like, oh god, that's perfect. <laughs> that was so freaking perfect. Ah. Oh. It's time like times like those. I'm like, I, I, Twitter could be so great, but Twitter could be so bad. But, it's, but it yeah. can be so great. Yep. Just like just like the uh, the yep. whole thing of someone taking a Michael Myers mask and painting it up to look like Ronald McDonald. <laughs> it tweeted the picture, and then one of the accounts, the one of the Michael Myers accounts, says, "I'm loving it." <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a screenshot of that on Discord. That was, it was just so funny. Ah. All right. Uh, on that note, we are going to take a quick break and be back with our weekly picks. We are back. It's time for weekly picks, and I lead off this week. 
And for my first choice, it is a new series. I, I'm assuming it's going to be a, a mini series. Not sure how many uh, issues. Uh, it does not refer. But this is from Dynamite Comics. And man, what a, what a team up! We, we've discussed before about the, the the crossover and team ups that Dynamite has has done that have been kind of unique, maybe would be the word. Uh, definitely interesting. But this one just this one you go okay yeah I'm why not before it's Elvira meets Vincent Price and the the, the premise of this is the ghost of Vincent Price has a mission he has to accomplish and he goes looking for Elvira to help her so I'm like oh come on come on uh, the synopsis says the apocalypse is coming and it's going to be live stream for binge watching, but a long lost movie can save the world. If only the movie star specter and the horror hostess with the Moses can find it in time. Okay. The, this is going to be, this is going to be fun. It, it's got to be fun. I think so. They're, yeah, their overrider titles that they've done up to this point have been fun, so I expect no less here. All righty, uh, Les, you are next. My choice comes from Bingo Books. It is Heroes Union number one, The Cosmic Crusade. There is a... Excuse me, there is a... a uh, a god, I guess, that half the universe uh, celebrates her genius, the other half cowers. And the only people that can defeat them are the Heroes Union. This is a new title from Roger Stern, Ron Friends, and Sal Basima. I'm in on this one because it is a Standalone story, 68 pages, and it's square bound. So I'm going to line up for this one just because it sounds like fun. Yeah, this is this is our friend Darren Henry, Sit Comics. And God, what a lineup he's got creating this book. No kidding. Holy cow. Yeah. So awesome. it's, it, yeah, it, and you talk about the 68 pages. Did you catch that price? $4.99. Really? Well, 68 pages. Dang, there you go. Not bad. That's a that's a hell of a deal, but that's one of the, that's been one of the trademarks for for Darren in his in his publishing line. So this, uh, yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be good. So. Cool. Cool. Uh, all right, Liz, you're next. All right, <clears throat> for my first pick, it's a new one out from DC. It's the Joker presents a puzzle box. Um, this one seems pretty neat. Uh, for one thing, it, it doesn't seem to involve Batman, so thumbs up. <laughs> I um, they discover a corpse, a magic box, and they got to figure out what happened. So GPD or GCPD is trying to piece it all together. They've got all these murderers locked up, and you know, it's got to be one of them, right? <laughs> Gotham's finest. So they start asking questions, and the only one willing to talk is Joker, of course. Go figure. So, <laughs> the one who can't shut his mouth. So they're saying, he, of course, with Joker, they should almost name him the Riddler because he never comes out and tells you exactly what you want to hear. It's always proposed in this way or maybe a short little story where you've got to gather the clues from that. And that seems like what this book is going to be. He's going to tell them a few stories, which should be pretty interesting. And they've got a piece together. What the hell that has to do with this magic box they found in this corpse. So should be pretty good. This has got uh, Matthew Rosenberg writing a story. So like I said, it should be pretty good. Hopefully it's something different they haven't given us with the Joker. I, I, I like the Joker stories outside of Batman. 
there was a reason why he was put on the top of Batman's list. So maybe this will kind of shine a light on what that is. Interesting. I like it. All righty. Uh, Mikey. Okie dokie. My first pick is from Dark Horse Comics. Um, and this is the second trade for Steeple. Um, Steeple is the story of a young woman named Billy who moved to this small town in England um, to work in the church. Um, and she, on their way into town, meets another young woman named Maggie, who is um, a leader, the leader of the Church of Satan in the same town. Um, well, th the first volume was the story of how um, Billy and Maggie managed to switch roles um, by the end of volume one. Um, and this is volume two, which is so the next the next stage of of the story um, in which these two good friends who are on opposing ends of the spectrum um, have to figure out how to get th these two different, completely different groups to work together to, to solve the problems of a small town, um, essentially, um, mm -hmm. including things like Christmas and an ancient evil from the unknowable depths of the Pacific Ocean coming for them. Um, so, you know, the usual stuff. <clears throat> right. Uh, but yeah, this this is a really fun series. There's some really fun characters. If it's Marlin, they're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> you realize this is the part where we actually publish this, what we're saying now, right? <laughs> okay, just checking. Just checking. Gotta love them small towns. Mm. <laughs> Indeed we do. Alrighty. Uh, I'm up again and for my second choice. Uh, it's a new series from artists, writers, and artisans. And the series is entitled Not All Robots. And the premise is that this is uh, the year 2056. And the workforce is totally handled by robots. And this story uh, focuses on a family known as the Walters, who has oh, obviously has a robot, but apparently in its spare time is building machines, and the family is afraid it it's going to be an army designed to kill them all. Hmm. Oh, kill all humans. That's always fun. Yes. Well, at, le at least the Walters. <laughs> at, at, to start with the Walters, and we'll go from there. Um, written by our friend Mark Russell, who brought us the Flintstones, the series from uh, in DC, and then the Second Coming from Ahoy Comics. Mm -hmm. and, Nice. And the arts by Mike Diodo Jr. I I love the premise. It's got it's going to be this is going to be pretty good. It's got to be pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. All righty, uh, Les, you are next. My second choice is Far Out Fables. Dr. Pied Piper and the Alien Invasion. This week, they are releasing, I want to say, six books of far, far Out Fables, this being one of them, obviously. And in this, the aliens land in the uh, land, their, excuse me, their spaceship in the town square of Hamlin. Now, the critters aboard are considered adorable, and everybody is uh, enamored by them. Hmm. But Dr. Pied Piper, Dr. Polly Piper, and uh, her 12-year-old twins, Tammy and Gerda Fredericks, 
think that something's up with all this. So you've got the twins, Dr. Piper, and her pet pig, Hamish, go to prove that the creatures are actually trying to do something diabolical. Hmm. That sounds cute. Interesting, yeah. Very interesting. All righty, Liz, you're next. All right. For my second pick, <clears throat> it's from Image Comics, and it's called The Me You Love in the Dark. This is one of um, Scotty's new ones. And um, let me see if I can pronounce his name right. Jorge Corona? Mm-hmm. Them. Um, they're back together. They're going to give us another spooky tale. This one will follow an artist named Ro, who moved from the city to the country to kind of get inspired. But they said what she is inspired with is not what she's expecting. Ooh, spooky. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're saying fans of Stephen King and Neil Gaiman will enjoy this beautiful, dark, and disturbing tale of discovery, love, and terror. Now, Stephen King and Neil Gaiman mixed together, definitely one you want to read with the lights on. <laughs> so, I'm pretty excited about this one. They, I don't know if, like I said, because I was talking about this earlier, I follow Scotty on Twitter, and I don't know if it's because I follow him, but they've really been pumping this one pretty hard. So hopefully it'll be pretty good. I, I'll love it no matter what because of who it is. <laughs> oh, you're not biased at all, are you? Not at all. But I do love a good spooky story, so hopefully this one will fit the bill. Yeah, this one was on my list, too. I'm ready for it. The little snippets he's been teasing with are really good. So I sent um, a screenshot to my comic book store. It was like, hey, can you get me this? <laughs> <laughs> I really need this. I bet they can. <laughs> yeah, they do. They are. They're pretty good. <laughs> All righty, Mikey. Okie dokie. So my second pick, I'm, I'm cheating a little because um, there are actually three of these coming out um, this this week. Um, this is from Capstone Publishing. Um, and this is an interesting little idea that I was not aware of that I stumbled across. And I think it's a really cool idea. Um, these are, um, they're, they're Looney Tunes based. So they're Looney Tunes comics. Um, and they they build them as wordless graphic novels. So essentially, you've got a a short graphic novel with Looney Tunes characters, um, and everything is done in the art. There's there's no word balloons or anything. There's no words on the page. So <laughs> you're just you're just getting just based from the action in the in the art. That's your story. Um, like there's there, one of them is called Rabbit on the Run, and it's it's I mean it's got a picture of bugs on the cover, and there's a turtle running behind him. Um, um, high, high rise hijinks uh, features Tweety and Sylvester. Um, Galaxy Golf has Marvin the Martian. Um, th the idea of basically comics without words. It's certainly not a new idea, but it's something we definitely haven't seen much of in a while, and I think it's a cool plan. I, I am curious to take a look at what these things, how these things go. Me too. I agree. I always like a story where you put it together yourself. It's pretty cool. Should be interesting. Should be fun. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, any... Special shout outs or mentions this week? Nope. Don't think so. Okay. We'll go ahead and go with our regular shout outs then. Want to thank Pop Goes the Culture Podcast Network for allowing us to be part of a great group of fellow podcasts. Definitely check them out. There will be a link in the show notes. 
We also recommend that you check out the fine men and women who make up Potter and Family, who have been so kind enough to spread the word of the fellowship on Twitter by retweeting our links. Uh, the best way to check out their work is to do a search, hashtag Potter and Family, one word, and just scroll through and whatever catches your eye, uh, by all means, download that episode and hope you have fun listening. Thank you guys, always. Uh, I want to thank Manny the Martyr for supplying the music to our podcast. Uh, in the show notes, you will find a link to where you can check out their music. Thank you, guys, as always. And finally, you, dear listener, thank you for downloading and listening to today's episode. We appreciate that. Uh, we value your feedback. Any questions, comments, suggestions, complaints, observations, what have you, uh, please send them our way. There are several ways you can contact us. Our email address is email at the fellowship of the geeks dot net. Or you can go to the go to the website, go to the About Us page, and there's a contact form you can fill out. Uh, earlier in the episode, we talked about having a Discord. We do have a channel specifically designed for feedback, or you can reach out to us. So another another reason to join our Discord. Uh, on social media, we're on Facebook, The Fellowship of the Geeks. And Twitter, we are at Fellowship Geeks. By all means, follow us, and you can contact us through there. If you like to follow us on our personal Twitter accounts, Mike can be found at Mikey Geek. Liz can be found at LN underscore Geek. Les may or may not be found at Fake Les Webster. And I can be found at Tom TC Geek. And from wherever you download our episodes, if you'd be so kind as to rate and review us, it would be greatly appreciated. Anything else before we say goodbye? Just thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you listening. Thank you for listening. We appreciate the support as always. And until next time, geek on, my friends. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks. And on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time... 